So it is a great pleasure to speak in, in front of Victor. I am very grateful to Victor for uh, uh, answering many of my uh, naive questions. I mean, I, uh, uh, a few years ago we uh, we discovered some uh, apparently hyperbolic Katzmudi structure popping up in uh, in a gravity context, and then I knew nothing about uh, the field. So. Many times I sent, uh, I talked to Victor and I sent him uh, emails. Uh, he always answered very kindly uh, my questions. I want also to, uh, to congratulate him uh, on the fact that he has just been elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences uh, in America. So, uh, so yes, so hyperbolic Katzmudi uh, structure. So the, the talk, uh, the, the topic I'm going to talk about uh, was something which was first conjectured <coughs> by uh, Bernard uh, Julia uh, back in 82. I should immediately say that it is connected to other uh, slight uh, different uh, ideas uh, like conjectures by uh, uh, Ganor and also by uh, Peter West uh, concerning E11. But um, what we did find evidence about was uh, the uh, hidden role of uh, E10, uh, which is an hyperbolic version of E8 in uh, supergravity in 11 dimension. And, but today, most of my talk actually will be uh, linked to uh, a baby version, let's say, of E10, which is called by uh, Victor AE3. So it's the hyperbolic version of uh, A1, okay, of uh, SL2 which has a, a decaying diagram uh, of this type, uh, which means that it has a, a Carton matrix, uh. which is something like that, <coughs> then minus one, minus one, and then zero elsewhere. So this is uh, mostly the object that I will be talking about. But uh, why uh, are we interested in this? So um, with some work with uh, Marc Henault, uh, done here actually, um, we were studying the general solution of Einstein's equation near a cosmological singularity in supergravity. And then we found that it had a chaotic structure which was described by the, the, the Weyl group of E10. Okay? And then after that, we looked more closely at other aspects of, of this in work with uh, uh, not only Marc Henault, but Hermann Nicolai and also Bernard Julia and Axel uh, Kleinschmidt and, uh, and others. And we found more and more evidence for the role of uh, this hyperbolic uh, Katzmudi structure. So hyperbolic means that you have a, a Carton matrix which has now a signature a minus plus plus in, uh, in my case. So for E10, it will be minus and plus 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 plus. And we will discuss here uh, uh, a rank three example where you have, uh, ah yes, no, I put the minus one in the wrong place. It's a, it's a three by three matrix, so the minus one is here, okay. Uh, then we conjectured with uh, Eno and, and Nikolai that um, there was actually an equivalence, uh, a duality between uh, supergravity in 11 dimension or more generally what is called M-theory, so what contains uh, superstring theory and all the objects, extended objects, and something which is a, a coset based on E10, and this coset is the coset of E10 divided by the maximally compact subgroup of E10. And the basic duality is to say that a certain theory in 11 dimension is equivalent to the quantum dynamics of a massless spinning particle on this coset space. So in, in a picture, the idea is that on one side, you have an 11 dimensional theory, which means you have a certain number uh, when you look at the zero modes uh, fields, which is gravity, the three form, the gravity, you know, and then uh, all the quantum <laughs> objects, uh, extended objects associated to that in, in M theory. And you, you, the idea is that the quantum dynamics of, of this uh, system would be equivalent to uh, the, the quantum motion of a particle, massless particle, but with some spin degrees of freedom on an infinite dimensional space, which is E10 divided by its maximally compact uh, space. Uh, so here you have a theory in 11 dimensions and here you have a particle, so something which is moving only with one parameter, but you quantize it. So 
So what was the evidence for this? The evidence was that one, one had partial evidence only, which is you have the, the field equations, let's say, of supergravity in 11 dimension. And we could show that if you look at the field equation of supergravity and you look at them near a Big Bang or Big Crunch singularity, you could introduce an expansion in an, uh, uh, which is labeled by a certain number of integers, which is the number of special uh, gradients that you take on a, in a general uh, uh, component of the field equations. And you assume, a la Belinsky Halatnikov Lifshitz, <coughs> that the spatial gradients uh, are in some sense small compared to the time gradient. So you have an infinite series labeled by all those integers. And on the other side, you have the, the motion, uh, which is just a geodesic on this infinite dimensional coset space. But you can also, uh, by expansion in, the, in all the generators, because there is an infinite number of generators, you can also introduce a height expansion of the equations of motion, and then we, uh, which are parameterized by uh, roots. And then we could show that up to level uh, 30 in height, there was an equivalence between the two sides. Uh, and there were several other aspects that could be checked. But there is something frustrating in this line of work, uh, like Maxim uh, mentioned the other day, that in a sense, this is, uh, there are some things that work nicely. You can prove some things, but you never know whether uh, if, if this is mathematically solid, whether there is really an equivalence between the two things. So recently with uh, Philip Spindel, we decided to do a different thing, which is to do a concrete uh, case study, which is to study one particular sub-example of supergravity, which is a, a reduction of supergravity, not in 11 dimension, but in 3 plus 1 dimension. So supergravity in our space-time dimension, three space dimensions and one time dimension. And we looked at uh, a triaxially squashed three sphere, which means it's a cosmological model where you represent the geometry of space as being not evidently a round three sphere, that would be trivial, but you, you deform the round three sphere by squashing it in, uh, in a way that I will explain so that it's uh, uh, I mean, the three sphere metric is invariant uh, under uh, left and uh, SU2 group and the right SU2 group. So you keep invariance under the left SU2 group. So you have a geometry which is homogeneous, let's say. You can translate the geometry over the three sphere, but it is not invariant under the, the right uh, SU2. So you have something which is deformed. So intuitively, this means you look at a geometry which looks like a rugby ball, okay? And, uh, and this geometry will evolve in time together with the fermionic degrees of freedom uh, exactly. And we will look at it as a function of time and in particular at what happens near Big Bang singularity. And we will do that in a supersymmetric fashion and in a quantum fashion. Quantum means here in the physics sense, so H bar, not a Q deformed, but real quantization of the thing. So what is uh, technically what we are doing is we consider uh, the action of uh, simple supergravity uh, over what is called a Bianchi 9 cosmological model, which is this triaxially squashed uh, three sphere, which means uh, space time geometry we, where there is time. That's just a gauge factor of if you want to change the unit of time. And then the space geometry is just a function of time when you express it in the in function of the local frame which is ma made of left invariant one forms over su2 you know three uh, one forms that satisfy this thing so uh, from the geometrical point of view this means that uh, i have this triaxially squashed three sphere how do you parameterize the uh, uh, general left invariant uh, i mean su2 left invariant metric is defined by giving the, uh, the metric, uh, therefore a quadratic form at one point over the SU2 manifold and then uh, transforming it all over uh, space, okay? So the geometry is parameterized by uh, a matrix, okay? Uh, uh, a symmetric matrix, so the, the local geometry in one frame. And, uh, but you can parameterize uh, this symmetric three by three metric by the Gauss decomposition. So you can decompose it in diagonal elements and then uh, a rotation matrix transpose on the left and a rotation matrix on the right. So S is a rotation matrix, which depends on three Euler angles. So this way I have parameterized the six components of a three by three symmetric matrix by uh, three uh, diagonal components. So the, the betas 
are the co-logarithm of the diagonal <laughs> elements of the metric, okay? And, uh, and then three Euler angles, which is the angles of rotation in order to put this uh, ellipsoid type uh, thing in diagonal form. Now, this was for the bosonic degrees of freedom, but there are also the uh, fermionic degrees of freedom, which are the gravitino uh, components. <coughs> and we represent the gravitino components in a special uh, gauge fix uh, frame. And in this frame, the gravitino components, uh, they, have, uh, they have one spinner index, which takes four values. And they have a special index, which takes three values. So we have 12. Uh, gravitino components and therefore uh, which are represented after some transformation by some fermionic objects which have two indices and index A which takes three values and in index capital A which takes four values and these are the components of the fermionic degrees of freedom in a local frame. Now <coughs> you take the action of supergravity and you, you replace uh, this geometry in it to see what is the dynamics which is predicted by supergravity as it is. And, and then uh, after going to okay, the Hamiltonian version, you find this type of action where uh, the beta degrees of freedom are connected. Yes, this thing is a bit too small. So, the, uh, so this action has the form of an Hamiltonian action. So I have conjugate momenta times time derivative of coordinates. So the three components beta are therefore the parameters that measure the deformed shape of the geometry. And their conjugate momentum are called pi a. Okay? The, the thetas that should have been <laughs> called phi are the uh, earlier angles, uh, which is the orientation of these quadratic metrics and their conjugate momenta. This is the phi phi dot fermionic terms, okay? And, uh, and then the rest of the action is uh, multiplied by some extra uh, components that come either from the metric, these were components in the metric, and this was one of the zero components of the gravitino. Just by looking at this, physicists will notice that these are, I mean, and mathematicians will notice that these are Lagrange multipliers, okay? which means that uh, part of the equations of motion is that the objects here on the right are zero because I have to vary by the thing on the left. So, so all those things will be constrained to be zero. But here I have the kinetic terms, uh, at least for the gravitino. And I have written here um, a quadratic form. So this quadratic form, which is the first hint that there exists, and this was the first one we found actually, uh, first hint that there is a ca hyperbolic Katzmuddy structure, is this quadratic form. This is the quadratic form defined in any dimension as the sum of the squares of uh, n objects minus the square of the sum of these n objects. So this is an hyperbolic uh, metric. And, and, and this will be the metric in Cartan space of the uh, hyperbolic Katzmudi algebra uh, AE3 in that case. Okay? Uh, and this metric, you see, it comes here. And therefore, it defines the kinetic terms of the gravitino. But when you look in the action before going to the Hamiltonian version, you find that the kinetic term of the, of the shape of the geometry is also given by the same quadratic form, GAB times the derivative of the logarithm of the shape. Okay. So, so you see, and, but this is linked to supersymmetry here, that the same quadratic form is coming in the bosonic sector and in the fermionic sector. And as I said, the fact that you have Lagrange multiplier means that you will have constraints. Now, how do you do the quantization? The quantization consists in saying, OK, I, have, uh, I can do simple quantization. Uh, the conjugate momenta are represented, I mean, Schrodinger-like quantization by derivative operators with respect to the beta. Same thing for the earlier angles. But for the fermionic degrees of freedom, as I have a kinetic term, which is phi phi dot, the quantization is that the anti-commutator of the phi's among themselves must be equal to delta unit. Okay, but this is a Clifford. Uh, it's a Clifford relation. It means I have certain objects, and then the anti-commutator of two of these objects is essentially a quadratic form in the right hand side. So this means that uh, the Clifford algebra, which appears, is spin eight with eight pluses, so signature plus minus eight four, and therefore. The, the, the wave function of the universe, which is the quantum representation of uh, the dynamics of the geometry in supergravity uh, described by this model, uh, is an object which is a spinner 
uh, of this Clifford algebra. So it is uh, an object which has 64 components. Okay? Uh, and the gravity in operators are what physicists call gamma matrices, which are 64 by 64 things. So, so here we have a quantum problem, but instead of having, like in the Schrodinger equation, you know, one wave function, you have uh, 64 wave functions coupled uh, together. And, and, this, and what is the Schrodinger-like equation? Schrodinger-like equation, they come from the constraints. They say that all the operators that appear with Lagrange multipliers in the action have to vanish classically, which in the Dirac sense means that when they are applied on the state, so here psi denotes the, the wave function of the universe. <laughs> so it is a certain state. And S is a certain operator. So here you write that the action of an operator, which is a differential operator acting on, on this object, is 0. So here you have 0, and here you have 0. These constraints you can solve exactly because you find that they are equivalent to saying that the wave function does not depend on the Euler angles. So it simplifies very much. You have the wave function depends only, finally, of, on the shape of the universe, how it is deformed, but not of angular factors. And at this stage, the uh, equations of motion of this quantum model is that the wave function, which is 64 components depending on three variables, must satisfy e these equations. These are four equations here and one equation. Not four, actually, because inside, pi is a differential operator. So these are PDEs, partial differential equation in three variables. But how many PDEs do you have? Here you have 4 times 64 equations here and uh, another 64 equations here. 4, only 64 unknowns. So this is a heavily overdetermined system of PDEs, which, because of supersymmetry, must be consistent. Uh, if the quantization is not anomalous, but this depends on computing the commute, the super algebra of the of these operators, and and this is where we did explicit computations like these operators, which are the supersymmetry constraints. They have this form. They have a, a leading term which is linear in pi's, which means linear in partial derivative d by d beta, multiplied by a gamma matrix. So it's like a Dirac equation. Each one for a fixed index here. This term would be the Dirac equation, okay? But then you have more complicated terms, including terms which are cubic in the fermion. So you have like a cubic Dirac equation. I learned recently from Victor that this is, but this, uh, what people study in the name of the uh, cubic Dirac equation is a simpler thing than, than these objects here. So, uh, so this is the supersymmetry constraint, and in it, you, you already certain objects appear, like there appears uh, twice uh, beta 1 here, and in these objects here, they appear the cotangent of beta 1 minus beta 2, uh, which is this, which will turn out to be roots. Okay, so the roots start appearing here of this Katz-Moody algebra. This is the cubic term. So this is the first time in this business that uh, people kept ex explicitly all the nonlinear terms in fermions, cubic in the supersymmetry generators and quartic in the action, uh, in the Hamiltonian. So we have checked explicitly, and it took us some time to find uh, this answer, that the anti-commutator of these uh, objects uh, close on, on, on H. You, you want, let me remind you that we want to satisfy that the S vanish on the state. So therefore, the anti-commutator of 2S should also vanish modulo S or H, which is another constraint. And indeed, uh, this equation is compatible with this. And therefore, you have uh, an open super open means that on the right hand side, I don't have constant structure constants, but also functions of beta. But it looks good. And so the main question we wanted to address in this work is uh, are there really hidden Katz-Moody structures in this thing? And, and we can give a precise answer. This is the full answer for the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian has a part which is quadratic in the pi's. So this part means essentially a Klein-Gordon equation. Uh, so it's the D'Alembertian in our three-dimensional space, because I remind you that this GAB is a hyperbolic uh, metric. Okay, It has signature minus plus plus. So this is like a Klein-Gordon operator. And then there are potential terms and also a mass term. Now, if you look at these potential terms, function of beta, they have an explicit form. And there is, uh, they are made of several parts. The, the simplest part, which ca you can see if you are not in supergravity already, is a sum of exponential uh, of linear forms in the betas. So this is like a Toda potential. 
and then you can read off in this Toda potential what are the, uh, the com linear combination of the betas that appear here. And these combinations are precisely the six level one roots of AE3 when you decompose it with respect to A1. So if you take a decomposition of this algebra with respect to the uh, A1, uh, which is just, uh, which is <coughs> just what? <laughs> which is just this. Uh, and then uh, you find that uh, you can decompose the infinite dimensional uh, AE3 uh, Katz-Moody, hyperbolic Katz-Moody algebra in an infinite number of levels. At level uh, zero, you get uh, you get simple roots, which are the differences beta 1 minus beta 2, beta 2 minus beta 3, and beta 3 minus beta uh, 1, which are the roots associated to the uh, GL3 subalgebra of AE3. Okay? So, sorry, yes, uh, we don't decompose with respect to A1. You, t you have uh, inside this subalgebra, you have the subalgebra, you have GL3. So, you decompose A3 with respect to GL3. Okay? There is SL3, but also GL3. So, these are the roots of the GL3 uh, algebra A3. And uh, part of the Hamiltonian contains also now other exponentials. Uh, so, this contains now. Uh, other roots, which is alpha 1 plus alpha 1, and I mean beta 1 plus beta 1, and beta 1 plus beta 2 that appeared before, uh, which are now the roots at, uh, at level 1, and they come with a certain quantum operators called J here, J here. And here you have also uh, other terms in one of our uh, singe square of these uh, roots here, which comes with the square of another operator, which is written on the next thing. So these are explicit calculations. Okay? You, you take a physical model, you quantize it, you study <coughs> its dynamics, and then you find that all those quantum operators appear. They enter. The Hamiltonian is a certain algebraic function. It's a polynomial in these things. And now you remark that these six operators, S1, 2, S2, 3, S3, 1, J1, 1, J2, 2, J3, 3, they, they do generate exactly via commutators a 64-dimensional representation of the infinite-dimensional maximally compact subalgebra K of AE3, which is the compact subalgebra formally defined uh, as the fixed point of the, I mean, the fixed set of the Chevalet involution. So, as Maxim has reminded us, I mean, you have the E, the F, and the H, and there is the Chevalet involution, which changes E minus F, etc. And then if you looked at the fixed set under this evolution, this is the set generated by EI minus FI, which still generates an infinite dimensional subalgebra. And, and these operators, they do satisfy exactly the commutation relations of the equivalent EI minus EFI, EFI defined by this uh, hyperbolic Katz-Moody algebra and its compact part. And this is a non-trivial thing, because to do it, you see, you have all those complicated things that come from supergravity. And these operators, they satisfy a quantum uh, anti-commutation relation, which is this Clifford algebra type thing. So you have to prove that the commutators, for instance, the commutators of these things is actually the commutators of three spin operators, like S1, S2 is I, S3. Uh, but to have the commutators of this J uh, precisely uh, reproduce what we had found before, which is the existence of a finite dimensional spinorial representation of KA3 is a non-trivial thing. So this is, and, and then, so this is a very precise statement uh, about the, the presence of operators that do generate uh, K of A3. And, but there are the most complicated terms in the calculations are the terms quartic in the fermions, okay, which are well known to be complicated things. And uh, the, the terms quartic in the fermions, they finally, uh, they separate in, in the terms I have shown before. Some of them were quadratic and some were already quartic in the fermions. And then all the terms I have written before had Toda-like potential. Toda means exponential of some linear form in the betas. Now, if I am, uh, the, the, the forms alpha of betas are linear equations in betas, okay? So they define hyperplanes. So these are the walls of this hyperbole. I mean, these are the, the vial chambers. These are the, the, the walls of the vial chambers and all the other chambers. And if you want to sit very far from all those walls, all those exponentials will be small, and then there will remain something. In addition to these Toda-like things, you have these mu-square terms 
which was the most complicated thing to compute. And this mu square, you find remarkably, although it's very complicated initially, that actually it commutes with everything else in the algebra. It belongs to the center of, of, of this algebra generated by S and J. And not only this, but it is itself modulo a constant, the square of a very simple operator, okay? Uh, which is this one, which is quadratic now in the, in the fermion. So you have very big simplifications coming in. And, and then you can discuss explicitly the, the solutions for the, the quantum universe described in supergravity in saying, okay, now you need to solve these Dirac-like equations. So you, you look for uh, 64 components column vector of uh, functions of three variables, and they have to satisfy four times 64 equations, okay? Uh, we could discuss in detail what is the set of solutions of these things depending on where you are in, uh, in quantum space. And actually, uh, the various quantum states, they are nicely parameterized by this operator, because this operator is like a Fermi number operators. It takes value from minus three to plus three, and there exist solutions at fixed uh, number of fermions, okay, fermion number operators. And in particular, uh, you find that uh, for some fermionic levels, you have only discrete states. You have uh, exact solutions like a, a kind of ground states and excited ground states, which depend only on a small number of constants. And then in the middle of fermionic space, you start having functional freedom in the sense that the general solution of this equation is parameterized by free, fu free functions, arbitrary functions of two variables. And then you can go beyond and say, OK, let's consider in particular uh, the wave function of the universe <laughs> in, in the fermionic levels where it contains arbitrary functions. So these wave functions is, can be made of, I mean, it can look like a wave propagating in internal space of the universe. And this wave is submitted to, uh, I mean, it, it, uh, it emits walls. These walls are the walls connected uh, with the simple roots of the vial chamber of AE3. And in some approximation, which is a WKB approximation, you can ask when I have this 64 component wave of the universe bouncing on these walls, what is the connection between the state after reflection and the state before reflection? So my vector, my 64 components, is a, is a linear vector in a representation space, 64 dimensional representation space of KAE3, of this uh, compact Katzmoody algebra. And, and what you find in confirmation of what we had found with Hillman in some Grassmannian approximation is that in the WKB limit, the state of the, of the, I mean, the, state of the universe after reflection is given uh, by applying on the previous state a certain reflection operator. But this reflection operator uh, lives in this uh, representation of the spinorial vial group. And therefore, it, in fact, defines a generalization of the vial group, which is not a bosonic type of vial group. In the vial group, usually, you have reflection operators. And the square of a reflection operator is, is 1, by definition of a reflection on the wall. But here, those reflections have, uh, are, uh, are eighth roots of unity. You need, you need to take the eighth power of the reflection to have unity. So because it is a spinorial extension of a vile uh, reflection. And, and you find that the, this general nice formula that the reflection operator on any of these roots, the simple roots, is given by exponential minus i pi over 2, the same j operators that appeared. Okay? So all those operators, which are 64 dimensional representation, they also define a spinorial extension of the vial group, which is present definitely in the quantum dynamics of the universe. Therefore, let me <coughs> conclude. So this is one particular case study, but uh, it's one in which we, we uh, took completely into account the quantum aspects of the dynamics of a triaxially squashed uh, three sphere uh, in supergravity. And this study uh, definitely confirms the, the hidden presence of hyperbolic Katzmoody structures in the sense that the Hamiltonian is made of building blocks and each building block is a certain uh, operator, which is a representation of, it represents the Serre relations, it satisfies the Serre relations for the objects EI minus FI. All, yeah, I should maybe say this. All the operators that appear here, they were 
uh, representations of these differences. OK, you had the EI, FI, HI. You had the level of the roots. So we could see all the linear roots linked to this. But finally, in the, in the Hamiltonian, the operators that appeared were representation of the E minus F, which is the compact part, in the same way that if you have the GLN and if you take the anti-symmetric matrices, you have, uh, <coughs> you have the compact subgroup of GLN, SON. So this is the analog for here. And so we could discuss the, the wave function of the universe and uh, prove, uh, I mean, control the number of solutions of these things. Uh, see that the squared mass terms, which is quartic in the fermions, belongs to the center of an algebra, which is the one generating the compact part of A3. So we hope that this result will help in clarifying uh, what was true in the conjecture we made before about E10. Because here we could do all this calculation uh, for the simpler algebra. I should say, uh, maybe I should not say it, but part of the calculations have been done explicitly with 64 by 64 matrices, because some of these calculations are difficult to do by hand. So we use some uh, computer means to compute products of 64 by 64 mat matrices to check everything. And in the case of E10, the dimension of these uh, matrices would be uh, 2 to the 320. So which means like 10 to the 50. So it would be impossible to do explicit calculations. But probably from the s very simple results we have here, one can guess what would be the Katz-Moody structure for the full supergravity in 11 dimensions, which is the real uh, challenge. OK, thank you for your attention. Are there questions? What happened to the reflection if you go beyond the WKB approximation? Uh, so the reflection. So first, uh, if you look at quantum states that uh, decay exponentially, you uh, you have modifications of this formula. Like for instance, in some cases, the reflection. If one wall is isolated from the other one, the explicit quantum effects of the reflection is given by a Kummer function. So you have I mean, a <coughs> confluent hypergeometric function. And then you have a dephasing upon the reflection, which is more complicated by just this, this thing. But it's a well-defined reflection. But does it give a deformation of the Weyl group or something like that? Uh, uh, I don't know if one should pose the question in, in these terms. Yes. I mean, the Hamiltonian, because the Hamiltonian, is still, uh, the Hamiltonian is still constructed from the operators that do satisfy exactly the usual, I mean, uh, Serre type uh, Katz Moody relations, OK? And uh, so the fact that uh, you have quantum effects that modify a WKB result is not a big deal. But, but, uh, but you're right, our question is a meaningful question. The, the dual picture, well, you started by mm -hmm. talking about this dual particle. So that was already in this example, it sort of comes in this yes. presentation. Exactly. So, uh, so in a sense, what we had found before were uh, parts of the, the picture that we have uh, here. Well, the evidence we had before could be seen, uh, it was just like the bosonic wall, OK? Or when we look at uh, fermions in the Grassmannian approximation, that this was this coupling in the Hamiltonian, which was part of this. So we had found parts of it. But here we wanted to see, OK, what is at the end, at the level of the quantum Hamiltonian, without approximation? And also the quartic terms in fermions. Because if the terms quartic in fermions had messed up the thing, but the fact that they commute exactly, in fact, I want to ask this question now that Victor is back with us. We formally, these mu square terms, the mass term should be a Casimir of k over e3. And formally, this Casimir is given by an infinite sum of uh, you know, the generator square, which is not well defined. I mean, he could define the Casimir for Katz-Moody because he could order things. But here we have compact uh, Katz-Moody, where uh, it's, n it's not a Katz-Moody thing. You cannot normal order things. OK, so there are uh, questions. But the fact that it commutes like a Casimir is a very good sign. More questions? Actually, I have a comment or a question. When you call the squashed uh, metric on the S3, is that the Berger metric? That is the, the one which you obtain by squeezing the, the sphere along the some circles which come small circles instead of being large circles? 
so it's, uh, it's an SU2 invariant. So it's the yes. most general SU2, most general SU2 invariant most metric, general. most general. So it has uh, six parameters or three shape parameters. That's why it's called squash. But it's squash in three directions. No more questions? So we're absolutely perfectly on time. So thank you to all speakers.